Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome all of you for this uh, highlight lecture this evening. Major General Charles Frank Bolden indeed does not need any introduction. All of you know he is an astronaut par excellence and an eminent administrator of NASA. And day before yesterday, during the opening ceremony of IAC 2017, all of you have witnessed Charles Bolden receiving the prestigious IAF World Space Award. His spaceflight experience spanning over eight years and four space shuttle missions is something extremely stimulating for all those aspiring to be astronauts. I am sure many of you aspire to be astronauts. He commanded two of the missions and piloted the others. His flights included deployment of the Hubble Space Telescope and the first joint US-Russian shuttle. And during his tenure as administrator of NASA, I think he has a magic number of eight that also was spanning over eight years. The agency's support of commercial space transportation systems for reaching low Earth orbit have enabled successful commercial cargo resupply of the space station and significant progress toward returning the capability of American companies to launch astronauts from American soil by 2017. He has established a new space technology mission directorate to develop cutting edge technologies for the mission tomorrow. The agency's dynamic science activities under Charles Bolden include an unprecedented landing on Mars with the Curiosity rover, launch of a spacecraft to Jupiter, enhancing the nation's fleet of Earth observing satellites, and continued progress towards the 2018 launch of the James Webb Telescope, the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Charles Bolden received almost 10 honorary doctorates from various universities, and he is a recipient of Defense Distinguished Service Medal, Defense Superior Service Medal, Legion of Merit, Distinguished Flying Cross, and recently the 2017 IAF World Space Award. I now invite, I am pleased to invite Mr. Charles Bolden to deliver the IAF World Space Award Highlight Lecture on Growing Opportunities for International Cooperation in Science and Astronautics. Mr. Bolden, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Rao, and um, thanks to all of you for coming out. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. My wife, Jackie, and I, um, she's here somewhere. There she is, I see, okay, got her back there. Um, you know, it was very gracious of all of you to invite me to, to have an opportunity to speak, and I must say what an honor it was uh, earlier in the week to be selected to receive the 2017 IF World Space Award. It was uh, very humbling and quite surprising. It's now been my pleasure to attend the IAC every year since our 60th annual Congress in Daejeon, Republic of Korea in 2009. My wife Jackie and I have been looking forward for the past few months uh, to the opportunity to attend our first IAC as uh, private citizens uh, with no other duties assigned. And I can tell you, it's uh, Robert, it's pretty nice. <laughs> I was especially pleased to learn early this week that the government of Australia has decided to establish at long last an Australian space agency. I think that excites many of us, particularly. Yeah. Those of us who have been coming here for, for many years. I've, um, I've always found that IAC is a a great model for another of my favorite organizations, the Space Generation Congress, and uh, that's organized and conducted by the Space Generation Advisory Council. And as I, I look around the audience, I realize that what I'm about to say, most of you already know, because you're it. Uh, but bear with me, because there are a few people in here who, who may not know how good you are and what you do. Um, 
for those that may not know, the SGC is a, it's a group of young professionals between the ages of 18 and 35, at least it used to be. Is that still right? Okay, got a lot of, yeah. And they're from, more than a, they're from more than 100 countries who work in support of the United Nations Program on Space Applications. And SGC is a non-governmental organization and professional network that, and I take this from, from their mission, it aims to bring the views of students and young professionals to the United Nations, space industry and other organizations, unquote. IAC similarly seeks to bring the views of aerospace, science, and engineering innovation innovative, in an innovative manner uh, to advance the cause of improving life on our planet by increasing our understanding of life throughout our solar system and the universe. One of my great joys during the period of time that I served as the NASA administrator was getting the chance to meet with young people all over the world. And, and while it may not feel like it, you can take it from me, I'm not going to tell you my age, but um, being any age less than 75 is still young in my book. I thought I would get a couple of hands from some people here. Let me share with you a couple of quotes as an introduction to my, my remarks tonight. Quote number one, and, and this is I, as best I can remember a direct quote. The first day or two up there, and by up there, the, the person who said it was talking about being in space. You try to recognize the countries. Then the speaker names his own country and says, quote, it stands out. It's very distinct. Then you keep missing the countries and you look only at the continents. By the sixth day, the whole world becomes a beautiful blue and white and yellow painting. Those boundaries really disappear with me they still are, unquote. The second speaker says, there is no better place to emphasize the unity of people in the world than flying in space. We are all the same people, we're all human beings, and I believe that most of us, almost all of us, are good people, unquote. The first quote that I gave you is from Prince Salman Abdul Aziz Al Saud of Saudi Arabia after flying as a member of the STS-51G shuttle mission in June of 1985. And the, the second quote came from the late Israeli astronaut Alain Ramon during his ill-fated STS-107 mission in January of 2003. You know, I thought about these quotes a lot two years ago while uh, many of us were in Jerusalem for our 66th International Astronautical Congress. I don't have to remind anyone in this hall that these are challenging times in that part of the world. In fact, uh, these are growingly challenging times throughout the world. Yet, there we were, an international community gathered in that place to talk about our shared destinies and our shared values. Uh, somebody asked me earlier today when I was doing an interview, what did I hope um, people would get from the things that I said and what did I hope to leave? What message did I hope to leave? And so I'm going to take a shot at it. And uh, if you don't remember anything else, my message to you is the U.S. has not given up its leadership. Um, when I left NASA almost a year ago, uh, I left it in the hands of a young man sitting here, Robert Lightfoot, who is awesome. Uh, for those of you who know him and have had an opportunity to work with him, uh, he comes from the colonies. <laughs> so now, let me explain that. <laughs> Robert was a center director. He ran the Marshall Space Flight Center, one of the largest centers in NASA. And uh, I brought him to Washington much against his desires because I really needed help in running the agency. And, and so Robert came up and and coming into the bureaucracy, he used to comment to me all the time about how, boy, life really wasn't like this back in the colonies. <laughs> and um, so I learned that anytime I wanted to know how life was in the colonies, how, how are things going with the people who make this organization, who make up this organization, I could always count on Robert and then later Lisa Rowe, who he brought up to be his deputy, who also came from the colonies, who was a center director at uh, at, at the Langley Research Center. So the two of them kind of kept us balanced and kept our perspective uh, in check about life in the colonies. Uh, our job 
Our responsibility coming from this conference is to help people when we go back home keep things in perspective about how life is in the colonies. You know, how are the people doing? And how can we blot out, if you will, some of the turmoil around us uh, and help people understand what it is that we believe in and what we think the future of this world will, can and will be. So that's kind of what I hope you'll take away from whatever comments I offer to you tonight. One of the highlights of my trip was the opportunity then to meet the members of the Space Generation Advisory Council that I mentioned earlier and to listen to their dreams and their aspirations for a future world at peace with human presence extended beyond low Earth orbit deeper into our solar system. And somebody asked me the other day, you know, what's going to happen with this incoming administration in the United States? And I said, um, you know, I'll, I'll take a chance. Uh, I think you're going to find that, that things will probably stay on an even keel. And I said, if they don't, uh, I know some young people who just won't stand for it. And they won't sit still for a lack of progress in humanity, finding a way to leave this planet, to extend ourselves deeper into our solar system and into the world. And uh, as I look around at the audience again, I feel really, really good um, that you're going to do what my friend Bill Nye back there talks about all the time. You're going to change the world. And that's what you do. That's why you come into this stuff. That's why you travel all the way around the world and come to a fora like this uh, at least once a year because you do want to change the world. And I'm confident you're going to be able to do that. Having been blessed to see our planet from, from space, I can attest that from up there, you don't see borders. You see a place seemingly at peace in tranquility in one beautiful planet. If you look really closely, you can see something else. It's a big sign that says, help wanted. Um, well, you imagine you see that, but you don't really. I came here tonight to tell you that our planet needs you. We need your leadership, we need your ingenuity, we need your imagination. We need increased international cooperation and collaboration. And as my good friend uh, and mentor, Jean-Jacques Dordain, the former head of the European Space Agency, used to remind me all the time, you know, doing things by yourself is really easy. Working together, that's hard work. That is very difficult. But again, the reason that we come together to fora like this is because we understand the importance of working together. And hopefully all of you understand that today presents perhaps the best chance that we have of international collaboration and doing a lot of the things that we've all dreamed about for so long. And we've all known that we just can't do them alone. While every agency represented here today would love to be able to step up and say, okay, I'm gonna do that. I don't need anybody else. When you dig deep down inside and you think about it, you recognize the fact that that ain't gonna happen. None of us can do it alone, so we really do need each other. For those of you still in your 30s or younger, you're in that sweet spot in your life when on the one hand, you're old enough to be role models and mentors to others, but on the other hand, you're still young enough that your professional and civic lives are really just beginning and you're more likely to be forgiven for your errors and, and inactions than later in life. Some of you may be parents already. Others might have younger siblings. Many of you likely supervise interns or younger staff. And in many ways, your future lives and careers will be defined by how we respond to the question of how we as one planet can come together to tackle some of our greatest challenges. I'm here this evening to tell you that I believe, I believe space exploration is one of the most important tools your generation will use to bring about the better future that you deserve, a more peaceful future, a greener future. Yours will be a future where human beings have pushed farther into the universe not just to visit, but also to stay. To me, public diplomacy and cooperation in space go together like peanut butter and jelly. I have three granddaughters. You all have heard me talk about them before. The baby, who is no longer a baby, 11-year-old Talia, loves peanut butter and jelly. 
So uh, that's public diplomacy and cooperation in space. They just belong together. All told at NASA, when I was there, and I think it's still the same, there are roughly 800 active agreements with more than 120 international partners. And if I, if I were to ask uh, Jan Werner or any of the other major space agencies in the world, uh, they'd give us some similar numbers because they recognize the critical importance of international collaboration and international cooperation. And they make it their a point to get out and to try to bring in other nations that want to be like us. While the purpose of all these agreements is generally scientific and technological, it's not lost on me that, like so many things when it comes to space, there's also a spin-off benefit. Folks across the world generally have viewed we Americans as generous, compassionate, innovative, and peaceful people, generally. <laughs> when I was the age of many of you, under the age of 40 now in our audience, much was made about the fact that our country was in a space race with the Soviet Union. Let's see if I can get this to work. Today, a child like my three grandchildren, 17 years or younger, has lived every single day, every single day of his or her life, while human beings from multiple countries are living and working together in space aboard this thing, the International Space Station, every single day of their lives. They have not taken a single breath when people have not been living and working together on the International Space Station. I still maintain that the space station ought to be considered, in fact, it ought to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And I'm serious. Think, just think about this. Tens of thousands of people from across eh, probably 15 or more countries have been involved in its construction and its operations, all working to, toward common goals of discovery, understanding, and human progress. The future of space exploration will create some remarkable opportunities for coming generations. In fact, it already has. And these opportunities can be summed up in one word. You know where I'm going, Mars. Let me explain why I say that. Our story begins with U.S. President Dwight David Eisenhower. You see, presidents in the United States ever since Eisenhower have floated the idea of going to Mars. It's not a new concept. But about 14 years ago, we had a horrible, horrible accident. On February 1st, 2003, we lost Space Shuttle Columbia. Following that accident, the United States made the decision that we should phase out of the shuttle program in favor of a new partnership with private industry and entrepreneurs to produce commercially available services to carry cargo and people to low Earth orbit. The shuttle had already had a remarkable three decades long run like no other. I traveled to space four times on the shuttle and I can tell you I love those spacecraft. But every technology evolves over time and although it was one decision with which I had not arrived lightly, I agreed with the recommendation, as did many in the space community at that time. In April of 2010, President Barack Obama came to the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base and the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and he delivered what I can still consider to be a major space policy address. It wasn't carried that way, but I thought it was a major space policy address. In it, he laid out a plan to replace our unsustainable exploration trajectory of the time with a clear, affordable, financially sustainable, and, and ambitious way forward, a way forward that would expand humanity's presence deeper into the universe while strengthening America's leadership in the world space community. The president called for expanding robotic and exploration, robotic and human exploration of the solar system. He asked NASA to move forward with a magnificent James Webb Space Telescope, as an example. That will be sent a million miles from Earth, and we intend, still intend to launch that with our international partners next November of 2018. He ramped up NASA's Earth science mission so that we can learn more about our own planet, including our changing climate. The centerpiece of the President's plan was and is a journey to Mars that will culminate with sending astronauts 
from the family of spacefaring nations back to the moon in the decade of the 20s and on to the red planet in the 2030s. To complete this journey, it was envisioned that NASA and our partners would expand all of our international cooperation to include more non-traditional partners around the world and would continue to develop the spacecraft, rockets, and other technologies that will bring American and partner astronauts to deep space. As part of these efforts, we expand, we expand our work with commercial and international partners on technologies that drive and have a legacy of creating spin-off benefits on Earth. And I'm referring to both economic benefits and benefits to our health and quality of life. And, and on the, the chart here are some examples of both government and public-private partnerships that have sprung up and in many cases have thrived over the last eight years or so. This is the way we get to space nowadays with cargo and eventually with crew. At the same time, we would extend the life of the International Space Station in low Earth orbit to at least 2024. To replace the space shuttle, we work with American commercial partners to send cargo and crew to the station, thus helping facilitate a robust commercial space market and a dependable commercial launch system. Seven years after President Obama challenged NASA to send astronauts to Mars in the 2030s, I believe we're closer to sending human beings to the red planet than ever before in human history. In the words of our present president in the United States, Donald Trump, we will unlock the mysteries of space. Meanwhile, a new consensus is emerging in the scientific and policy communities around the global exploration roadmap developed in 2030 through the efforts of some 25 or more international partners. Since these early days on our current exploration trajectory, the Orion crew vehicle has flown farther into space than any spacecraft built for human passengers has flown in more than four decades. And it did that in December of 2014, almost three years ago. ESA, the responsible agency for development of the Orion service module, continues its steady march for final delivery and flight. And as we all know, space is hard and building spacecraft is sometimes even harder. The Space Launch System rocket, the SLS, that will someday propel international astronauts to deep space has moved from concept to development and construction. And uh, I like fire and smoke and noise, as does Robert, since he used to run a test stand, or several test stands down in Stennis. And so if you bear with me, I've got a short video because I like to take a moment at this juncture of my comments to say, okay, he's talking about stuff that's on, on the drawing board somewhere. But I want to take uh, just a few minutes, I think it's about three minutes, to show you, there'll be some cartoonish stuff in here, but most of what you're going to see is actual tests that are ongoing today around the country and, and around the world that are helping to prepare SLS and Orion for its maiden voyage that we call Exploration Mission 1. So uh, kind of hang on to your seat if I can get this to work and, and we'll see.
missions represented by many of you here tonight continue to make new discoveries with missions such as uh, those that we're doing with the Hubble Space Telescope, with Kepler, with Soho, Cassini Huygens, Rosetta, GPM and DPR, Hinode, Hayabusa, the Mars Orbiter Mission, New Horizons, Juno, and many more. And uh, for those of you who may not have recognized it, all those are not American. They represent an international collection of missions exploring our universe. On the horizon in the, in the next few years are missions such as the James Webb Space Telescope, InSight, Mars 2020, and the Emirati Mars mission. This is a global undertaking. Many nations all over. There was once a time that we could say there has been one nation to ever land on the surface of Mars. We can't say that anymore. Because when Curiosity landed on the surface of Mars in 2014, you can see the flags that are on the vehicle, which represents hardware from multiple nations, not just one nation, multiple nations that are on the surface of Mars today. Some of you represent uh, ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization. They have the privilege of bragging uh, that they are the only agency to have ever done something about space. The only agency to have ever reached Mars successfully on the first attempt. But that was because of the collaboration among their other international partners and the efforts of ISRO. There is a significant transformation that I strongly believe must be made, however, to optimize our chances for advancing our efforts to extend human presence deeper into our solar system. And that transformation will be to include the men and women of the China Space Agency and the current family of nations working on the International Space Station. Now that's a tall order. And I say that. I can say it now because I'm not sitting where Robert is. Uh, I say that as one who has worked diligently over the last eight years with the Congress of the United States and with our international partners and others uh, to try to make that happen. Bill Gerstenmeyer sitting out there in the audience and Peggy Whitson who just came back from the ISS after 10 months and I were privileged to go to China in 2010 uh, where we actually uh, were sent to see what the probability or the possibility was of, of future collaboration and, and I think I can speak for all three of us we came back very positively impressed. So I believe that, that one day it will happen and I think the sooner the better because we need to include their ideas on lunar and Mars human exploration into our deliberations on the road ahead. Because remember what I said, it's easy to say we want to do this alone. This cannot be done alone. Uh, the competition today is the competition of ideas. For us, our new world is one of collaboration and cooperation. We fight before we go to the drawing board about which ideas are best, but then once we make a decision, we go do it. Critically important today is that our journey is starting to capture the public's hearts and minds and imagination. There's a tangible sense that I get as I travel around and meet folks that space exploration is kind of in vogue right now. This coolness factor is what inspires young kids to want to study science or write a science fiction story. And all these things make a difference. In fact, there are some students sitting in the audience right out there that I know right now wouldn't be here if they didn't think it was going to happen. And trust me, uh, they are going to make us make it happen. Or they're going to push us out of the way. When I think of the world in which my kids and grandkids and your kids and my granddaughters will be raising their own children, I see a world where their kids view human beings living and working on Mars as a fact of life, much like they view living and working on the International Space Station today, a future where NASA and the international partners are using Mars as a stepping stone to the rest of the solar system. I see a future where a robust private space industry is launching human beings, cargo and satellites and all sizes to, the, to space at a significantly lower price point, thanks to the work that we're doing today to make launches more affordable and to advance emerging small satellite technologies like CubeSats and NanoSats. 
A future where the next great global space and technology company utilizes technologies developed for space travel to develop a product that improves our quality of life here on Earth. A future where flying from Sydney to Tokyo is a better experience both for the people in the plane and on the ground because we've succeeded in reimagining air traffic management and we've made flight cleaner and greener and safer and quieter. By flight, I mean both airplanes and helicopters. I see a future where our grandchildren's children are drinking cleaner water, breathing cleaner air, and making use of cleaner energy, not only because our international partnerships have helped us better understand climate change, but because of the work our scientists are doing in areas like green aviation and water purification. I see a future where fewer citizens of this planet are losing a sister or a son because the medical technologies we perfect to protect our astronauts from things like exposure to radiation on a long duration space flight help revolutionize medicine right here on Earth. Or because the technologies we've developed to detect signs of life on other planets continue to help emergency workers listen for the beating hearts in the rubble of a disaster. Uh, an example would be the finder uh, detection mechanism that was developed for finding things on the surface of Mars and today is used by first responders all over the world in cases of earthquakes and hurricanes and natural disasters of that form. I see a world where girls and young people of color are more excited about pursuing education in science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math. A world where, unlike today, there will no longer be any states in my country of the United States where no women take the advanced placement AP computer science exam, thanks in part to NASA's work to promote STEM education and careers. I see a future where people in even the most remote corners of our world, places like Niamey Niger, where we went last summer to open up the fourth uh, hub of the Severe Network, where they have no internet. But I see a future where even in the remotest parts, the remotest corners of our world, young people have access to Wi-Fi, as do astronauts living and working in space today. I see a future where maybe, just maybe, just maybe, humanity finds the answer to the age-old question of whether we're alone in the universe. While none of us can know for sure what the future has in store, there's one thing we can say with a good degree of certainty. None of this and none of these things can happen on their own. They'll require future leaders to continue to make choices that point us in this direction. Future presidents, future administrators, and future citizens. Some of you, I hope, will choose to turn away from your dream of becoming an astronaut temporarily and become a teacher. Or, heaven forbid, become a parliamentarian or a <laughs> member of Congress or a member of the Duma or something else because we need people with your intellect and, and your sharp minds to lead governments. You can always come back and fly in space. We are embarked on a visionary course. It's my sincere hope that future leaders from all sides of the political spectrum and throughout the world will see it through because I truly believe the sort of future I laid out is within our grasp. As I close, I want to share with you a quote from a Department of State telegram written in July 1969, and, and it goes like this. The Russian press was surprisingly generous with its praise of the men behind Apollo 11 and American space research in general during the days that the historic moon voyage was in progress. But now they seem to fear that the landing may have increased respect for the Americans around the world. It was the Cold War, after all. Another State Department telegram read, 5,000 Hungarians walked through the American embassy yesterday. They came to pay tribute to Apollo 11. They came in overalls spattered with paint, in smocks, in tie and suit, without shirts, old and bent, young and athletic, students, workers, older people, end quote. It noted that even the secret police were cooperative and good-natured. 
Indira Gandhi, then the Prime Minister of India, declared that the moon landing was, in her words, one of the most exciting and significant moments in human history. The Queen of England reportedly stayed up with her children to watch. The Pope spoke about humankind's pursuit of a new destiny. In New York City, people took to the streets to dance and to celebrate. The Houston Chronicle, my old newspaper, the Houston Chronicle wrote, for a moment, it seemed like all men were brothers. Communist journalists congratulated American scientists. Israeli photographers beamed at Egyptian broadcasters. Brown hands grasped white ones, and few eyes were dry. The world went out in 30 languages to 1,535 radio and television networks, to 1,056 newspapers, and to 445 magazines in 57 countries. We, many of us in this room, witnessed similar worldwide reactions on the evening that Curiosity touched down on Mars after surviving its seven minutes of terror through the Martian atmospheric entry three years ago. Just think, just think of what it's going to be like when your loved ones are watching the first astronauts from Earth reach Mars. Just think. I am pleading with all of you to join with me and all of the space agencies of the world to continue to turn science fiction into science fact and to make them possible possible. God bless all of you. Thank you very much. famous astronaut Sunita Williams once told, I quote, when I look at Earth from space, I don't see any boundaries of any countries, unquote. Thank you, Mr. Walden, for giving us this wonderful and exciting message on the international cooperation. I'm aware that uh, we have run a bit late into the evening, but still, always there is a room for a few questions, I'm sure, which you are eager to ask. Uh, I leave the floor to you now. Yeah, please. My granddaughters. <laughs> hey, I, yeah, yeah. I, I'm quick to answer that question because people frequently ask me, what am I most proud of? I'm, I'm most proud of the, the two kids my wife and I have produced. She did work, of course. <laughs> But my son and daughter, who are now adults themselves, but then the three beautiful granddaughters that we have that just uh, continue to make our lives incredibly rich and, uh, and, and inspire us to want to wanna make the world, the world better. That's, that's the thing about which I'm most proud. Any more? <laughs> Get off easy. Oh, one more. <laughs> Wow, you know, the question was if everyone, if everyone on Earth could see the view that, that we see from space, what do I think society would look like? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that you know, society would change its appearance at all, but I do believe that, that people would take on a different perspective uh, when it comes to appreciation of this planet. I, I'm asked, one of the questions I'm asked quite frequently is, were you changed when you went to space? And I think, you know, it's usually people don't want to ask a question about faith and religion, and so they say, were you changed? And I tell them all the time, well, I, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a, what, what we felt was a, a Christian family, and my mom and dad taught me pretty well and you know, let me kind of make up my own mind about what I was gonna do, but they gave me the basic uh, foundation that I needed. 
And, um, and when I went to space, it didn't really change me at all. What it did was it strengthened my beliefs about, about life, uh, how good it is. Um, it strengthened my belief that, that we really can work together on the planet, that we really can uh, work as one people in spite of the fact that there's some of us who don't particularly want it to be that way. Uh, I mean, if you stop and think about your lives, your growing up, uh, you have to be taught to hate. That's not, that's not an innate characteristic. Um, kids don't realize that they're different until they go to school and then all of a sudden they find out that, well, they're different. And so I think that one of the things that we can all do, because we do work on common missions and common goals and, and have dreams alike, is to just kind of work bit by bit to help other people understand what we understand from the perspective that we have. Help them understand the importance of maintaining our planet, uh, preserving it you know, as best we can, um, trying to clean it up a little bit better than we've been doing. But, but those are kind of some of the things that I, I think people would do if they, if they had an opportunity to go to space. And that's one of the reasons that I really hope that in the coming years, we, we'll never get millions of people in space, but I sure hope we can get, get them there by the thousands uh, because that, it gives us a little bit more hope of changing more people quicker. So, thank you all very much again. So, on behalf of you, let me thank Mr. Bolder for this excellent highlight lecture befitting the IAF World Space Award. Ladies and gentlemen, I request all of you to give him a big applause.